Hey, and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife. A couple of big topics this week. We're going to review the King of the Jungle portfolio because we haven't looked in on that for quite some time. There's a good reason Monkey doesn't want to look at that chart. <coughs> and we'll talk about all of those reasons. What else have you got on the docket, Christoph? Well, you have just posted a phenomenal overview of all of your companies, your portfolio review. It was a massive hit on X. And I'd like to ask you a few questions and see what insights you gained from the process. Sounds good. Sounds good. That little project is now finished. That's good. And you're going to tell us a little bit about some of the latest Tesla news, particularly Musk's world tour, trying to get regulators to agree to roll out FSD. Indeed. And speaking of Tesla, one of the main, what we look for in a good investment categories has to do with visionary leadership. So we'll talk about that quality. Yes, sir. Let's get into it. All right. So Badger, you looked at your portfolio from the time you started investing, having tracked your buys and sells, and you reviewed each position one by one over the last 50 days or so. And then you collated all of those reviews into one post on the X and it sure got the attention of Fintwit. It's been viewed hundreds of thousands of times, bookmarked many times, and you received quite a lot of engagement. Yeah, I've been having some good fun chats with folk who have asked them questions and pushing back on different aspects. So it's good to do this kind of review in public yeah. if you're open to constructive criticism, which I think I am. You are. So first of all, how do people find this work of art? Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, I'm just going to check out my, check out my Twitter, my ex. Uh, I am at 7 Luke Hallard. And it's pinned, correct? It's a pinned tweet, yep. Yep, so it's the first thing you see. Do you have any, now that you've finished the project and engaged with responses, about some of which I'd like to ask you about, but do you have any additional or new insights into the value of that project or... Uh, anything unexpected that you learned that we haven't talked about? I think, I think we have covered like some big elements of it. I mean, it is insanely valuable just to do a review every couple of years and try and learn lessons. That's the only way to improve, right? If you can measure it, you can improve it. Uh, but you, you have to not just measure something. You have to actually go and review the measurements and try and draw lessons out. So this is something every investor should do. I don't recommend necessarily doing it in public on a social network. And this was pretty hard work because I made like a little video on Instagram for each day. That probably wasn't necessary, but kind of fun little project just to try and make the Instagrams get, get jamming. Uh, but the value was in actually going through all of my existing holdings and some of my key prior holdings and just trying to figure out, did I play those well or badly? And what lessons can I learn so I can do better next time? Did you learn any particular lesson that you feel you still have a growing edge around or that you can improve further? Yeah, I did. Uh, there's a couple of things maybe I took as being an error. Maybe they're not such a big error. Like one thing I have given myself a kicking for in the past was selling chunks of my Amazon stock on two occasions to purchase a BMW in 2016, and I sold another chunk to purchase my first Tesla in 2019. And here we are in 2024, and I'm just about to do the same thing. Not selling Amazon, but I'm going to take some money out of the investment portfolio to buy the new Tesla when, it, when I hit the top of the list in the next month or two. Uh, and I've gave myself a kick for doing that previously, but actually the reality is you've got to live your life. Um, and... I try and prioritize experiences over buying stuff, but it's a, it's just time to refresh the car. And where else am I going to get that money from as a retiree than uh, by pulling it out of the portfolio? So I probably shouldn't be too hard on myself over that one. I think it's as bad a mistake, if not worse, to forget what money is for. So in an 
platonic sense, selling whatever stock because it continued then to go higher. If you're only playing that game and you want to win that game, then sure, that's a mistake. But we see this over and over in life in general, where people get so obsessed over the game, they forget that it is a game that's meant to serve a higher purpose. And so I'm surprised to hear you say, not surprised, but given that what I know of you, that you really do value living, to still have that part of you that says, well, you know, this might, to still put that as a mistake, a kind of error, I guess it could have been an error back then, because back then I was working and earning a paycheck. And maybe I should have just say, put some money aside to buy those cars, as opposed to perhaps being lazy and taking it out of my investment account. But now I am in retirement and I am living on my investments. Maybe it would be a mistake if I just woke up one morning and were said, oh, hey, I want to go like heliboarding in Alaska. And that's going to cost like 10 grand. And I just pulled the money out and just went and did it without really thinking about it. At least if I'm making a substantial purchase, it should be a considered decision. That's right. And by considered, I think you mean something you either really love, like like an experience that defines your life because you love to travel. It's not just on the whim right. or it's not based on off of greed or, you know, status or some of these traps that, that many people fall into. But I would argue something like, you know, having a safe car that you know, an item that you use every single day and improves the quality of your life. In this context that we're talking about, just because Amazon continued to go up does not mean that having bought a good car was a mistake. Yeah. And hey, I was in Austin the other week and I got sat in your fancy Model 3 Performance with its cool white leather. And I figured, hey, I need need a white interior in my car. I'm bored of this gray ass shit. That's right. You didn't say anything about my self-installed purple Prince lights on the, <laughs> on the, <laughs> that's a little custom mod I did all by myself. I did comment on the very dangerous giant fluffy dice or whatever that thing was hanging from your <laughs> rear view mirror. That's uh, I think those are not even allowed in the UK anymore. <laughs> all right. So one of the things uh, I saw that got my uh, own attention in your comments and questions was how did you manage to turn a profit in the 2008 uh, bear market where if you if you go back over investors' returns that have kept meticulous records like you did, the drawdowns are usually somewhere between, what, 30% and, and 50% d- depending. I mean, they're massive, massive drawdowns, but you were still, what, you actually made a profit that year. Uh, how did you do this? What yeah. shenanigans did you pull? No shenanigans. I, think I, I got a little bit lucky, I think. So like that was super early in my investing career. And I really just bought, I started becoming an investor in 2004. But I only really bought my first individual stock in 2006, which was Intuitive Surgical. And I bought a lot of it. Like I probably allocated, I don't know, like 25% of my portfolio to that one company, which is insanity. I would never do that today. But when you're young and the numbers are much smaller, you can take those risks, whether they're considered or not. I don't know. And that played out really well. Like that company just performed super well through that part of the world while, yeah, like some bad stuff was happening around the uh, financial crisis. Didn't impact my robotic medical company which was going from strength to strength, and that held up my portfolio. So it's not, it's, not, it's not a lesson, unfortunately. It's not replicable. Like I can't learn anything from that that I can actually use as part of my tool set. Right. I'm, gl- I'm glad you said that. I mean, uh, luck, you know, luck, whether we like it or not, is part of investing. And yep. in that sense, I mean, I'm, uh, th- this is in no way a critique of your entire process and your results, obviously. But let's imagine intuitive surgical did not succeed. And so all of a sudden, those years returns, you know, get cut in half, and then all the com- compounded growth is less. But I think like, like you're saying, uh, it's not a mistake. It's just you can't expect to survive 40% drawdowns in the regular market being up 10% unless you've done something unusual and that requires some amount of luck 
to be on the right side of it. Over the, what, 20-year period, you've stuck to your principles and with a little bit of luck, you know, they just, the, the returns are even higher. Yeah, that's, that's true. I and mean, the main thing is trying to keep out of your own way and don't take actions that maybe hamper luck's ability to help you. So uh, I saw you dealing with some trolls. They yeah. weren't, there weren't too many, right? I mean, mo- most of the, the trollish commentary is like, I don't believe you, right? It's like, yeah. these numbers can't be true. <laughs> yeah yeah cool yeah whatever <laughs> right i mean it, it you know from the I, I mean from uh i think one of them uh one of the best answers you gave i think was like oh so you're saying you're better than buffett or uh and i think you said like give me another 20 years <laughs> i think yeah i think the comment was uh if you're so good how come no one's heard of you <laughs> yeah yeah, there we yeah. Go. yeah why aren't you warren, warren buffett yeah, okay, I've got, I've got only 10,000 followers on Twitter. Some people heard of me. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, for sure, I do not for a moment compare myself to some of those legends. Yeah, give me, give me another 20, 30 years. <laughs> but there's a really important lesson here, Luke. Yeah. I mean, you, you're an average guy in the sense of you are not one of these legends. You know, there's only a few legends. But most people really don't make the connection that I, too, could really succeed at this. Most people do think, you know, they they idolize or they fantasize or fetishize these mega investors, right? And say to themselves, I could never do that. And that's why I think it's so startling for people to see uh, a guy like you. And I, I mean, average, you know, in the kind of more mathematical sense, right? Like you were a guy with a professional job who learned how to invest and did it for 20 years. And lo and behold, you have a staggering uh, success story that most people, when they look at it, say, whoa, whoa, whoa that, uh, you know, what's he, what else is he doing? But not you're not really doing anything else. Yeah, I, th- I think that's true. And I, you're right. I think it's, I, I have had some luck, but I think it's available to anybody. Like it doesn't require a absolute ton of work it requires some work but i mean even just investing like just sticking your money in a passive index tracker is going to make such a t- change to your life if you can give you know if you can start doing that today and keep doing it for 20 years and look back in 20 years um and you've even if you've just achieved market returns that's life-changing i don't know today's uh today's like rush culture 20 years is a long time people can't wait that long and if you can't, you're much more likely to do stuff that's probably more likely to destroy your wealth rather than grow it. And I've made plenty of those mistakes, including <laughs> recently in the last year. So, you know, uh, it, it's always, it's hard. So, like right here on this podcast, right, we're sharing our honest stories, right? And yeah, Christoph has owned up our, to uh, some pain that he's caused himself. He and I are cut from the same cloth and we've been doing this long-term thing for a long time, both of us, like you've been using that as long as I have. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you lost the path and now you're trying to find, forge a new path. <laughs> that's, that, that's right. That's right. But you know, uh, to, to make this sound encouraging, I just turned 45. And so I've been investing, you know, since I was 17. So, but I still think that given that I really take care of my health and, uh, with advances in medicine and so on and so forth, fingers crossed that by the time I'm 65, I'm, I'll still be uh, fairly, you know, young in body and spirit. That's another 20 years. Yeah. You know, like 20 years is still a, a long time. And so just because you, you know, I made a huge mistake in the last year doesn't mean I can't get back on the horse and still have a very long and winding, winding uh, successful investing second half. So getting the principles, you know, right. And not saying to yourself, it's too late is as much part of the game as anything else. Yeah, absolutely. I saw I read a good tweet today. Someone had said, if you exercise for one hour, you add eight to nine hours to your life. Uh, hmm. Like I'm just back from a run. Um, yeah, like health is wealth. Yeah, if your health is much more important than anything else, um, 
So yeah, do that as well. This isn't just an investing podcast. <laughs> so, right? This is a lifestyle podcast. That's <laughs> right. Mind. Yeah. Next week we'll have some calisthenics uh, demos for you. So, uh, what else do we look for in a good investment? What did we cover last time? We talked about long-term trend, trends and strategic alignment. If companies align with long-term trends that are shaping the future, those companies are basically they're in like the fast lane to success because they've got this trend pushing them towards success. Right. And uh, an obvious example of that is the current mega trend of AI. Today, mm -hmm. we'd like to talk about another one of these factors, visionary leadership. Yeah. And I suppose the way I wrote about this in my mega thread was um, if a company is founder led and can inspire exceptional culture, then uh, it has significant advantages, essentially. And I think the classic example of this is one of the companies we're going to talk about on today's docket, Tesla. Um, you know, like him or loathe him, Musk has drawn incredible engineering talent to all of his companies um, because people just want to work with like people who change the world like that. If you can recruit the best of the best and if you can breed a culture of innovation where these mega performers don't have bureaucracy and crap in their way, like the culture is all about enabling and moving fast and being innovative then that gives you a huge advantage as a disruptor, whether you're a tiny company or whether you're a massive company. In the comment about founder-led, that's kind of like a, maybe that that feels like a cliche or maybe it's uh, unappreciated enough, but that's a big deal because if you consider why people go into business or start companies, there are multiple reasons. For many people, it's a way to just make a lot of money and cash out. But every so often you come across the kind of person whose entire life's purpose is the company, the idea, it's, uh, it's beyond, it's beyond a business. It's beyond, you know, the, the motivations are so much bigger. And when you have one of these people who not only starts the company, but brings it into being and into success. And then after having made more money than they know what to do with, they continue to stay on. That's how you know that this person's, this, this leader and the talent that you talk about uh, that they're, they will invite is led by something that is one of these intangibles that makes a tremendous, tremendous difference because these people are messing around, you know, with low hanging fruit. I'm thinking of, you know, uh, your largest, uh, King of the Jungle Holding, I believe, CrowdStrike, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, uh, used to be one of my biggest holdings until I stupidly cashed out too early. So, um, yeah, founder-led. and Yeah, great, great example. George Kurtz, fantastic founder leader. He's described CrowdStrike as a generational company. And, you know, he cut his teeth in the cybersecurity industry, working in different firms himself, and then just had a vision for a better way of doing the stuff and built CrowdStrike. And now it's well regarded as uh, one of the strongest cybersecurity companies in the world. I wonder, is, is a company like Apple still considered founder-led? I, I don't think so, right? Because Steve Jobs died. But, you know, as a little bit of nuance, he was the kind of, you know, investing in Apple was investing in Steve Jobs. But then he carefully, uh, over the years, cultivated a culture that D, a culture with a certain particular DNA. And I, it's not surprising to me that Tim Cook inherited a bunch of that DNA from Steve Jobs. So even though he's not a founder, he still operates, I think, by many of Jobs's principles. And so it's, you know, we don't necessarily have to take this literally, although it's nice, but I'm talking about founder-led as a kind of mindset. Hmm. It, it, I mean, it can be an advantage to literally be founder led, but none of these criteria are black and white. Like, you know, if you only invested in founder led companies, it doesn't automatically mean you're going to be a successful investor. It's just one of the things that you tend to see in companies with a really, really deep, strong culture and a, and a sort of passion for innovation. So shall we talk about uh, Tesla, our, our go to example of being founder led? Yeah, let's do that. But before we do, let's just have a quick reminder 
to our listeners a quick plea. We are still a new podcast. Really. This is episode 25 and we're struggling with growth. You know, we're less than a thousand people listen to us. Surely these insights deserve to go to a few extra ears. So if you get a chance, the most valuable thing you could do to help us scale and to encourage Christoph and I to carry on with this project for at least another 25 episodes mm-hmm. would just be to leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. Come on, guys, it takes uh, takes two minutes. And I don't think we've had a new review uh, ever. There's some legacy ones there from way back in the telescope investing days. So go on, someone get over there. Give us a five-star review if you think it's a five-star performance or drop us a comment on Twitter if uh, you can think of ways we could improve our shtick. Yes, please and thank you. <laughs> so tell us about Tesla. Well, Tesla had a pretty big week. Earnings came out and the numbers in terms of what well, this is this is what's fascinating about, about in, investing you know you you look at the you could interpret a company's success and path in so many different ways the numbers on the surface were not good a lot of uh there's revenue slowing down there was a massive drop in free cash flow there was lower than expected profits i mean basically uh on the on the surface Anybody that isn't looking at the the bigger picture had reason to disparage the earnings and call them bad. However, the the stock went up uh, regardless, some some I don't know five six percent or so, because Musk, this visionary leader that we're talking about, more or less confirmed for the market that the lower priced Tesla is still scheduled to be manufactured and delivered uh, or start manufacturing end of 24, 25. So there is a lot of speculation in the market that the robo taxi would simply take place of this lower entry vehicle. So uh, the market is still not sold on the robo taxi as, uh, as, as something viable for the company. They definitely want to see the lower cost vehicle. So Musk delivered on, on that. So the stock rebounded. Let me ask you something I found a bit incongruous here, and I can't figure out. Maybe you've got an answer. Previously, Musk has pushed back on the idea of the lower cost vehicle. Like, let's say, like, whatever they call it, the Model 2, the Model something. But, like, what is it, like $25,000, that that sort of price point vehicle? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think he's pushed back on that, saying, once we have RoboTaxi, once we have true FSD, it adds so much value to your car like essentially to sort of cut through the, the noise, if I want a cheap car, I just buy like a Model 3, which is what, $40,000. And I just turn on like robo taxi mode and I let it go out there and earn me like $10,000 a year. And that's my cheap car because it's earning cash for me. So here's my challenging question. I don't know the answer. The fact that they are still, they have the cheap, the, the lower cost car on the roadmap and they're seemingly prioritizing it. Does, is that an admission that actually RoboTaxi is really going to be a long way away because owners won't make that cost saving in the next couple of years? So going back to Tesla being founder led, we know that Musk is a once in a generation type thinker, engineer, and he has all the talent in the world working with him to try to make his crazy ideas a reality. Uh, but he's also known for distorting reality and timelines. This feels to me like a balanced middle middle path between saying, yes, the the robo taxi project is still uh, the goal and aim. But we also know that because of the extraordinary level of difficulty in achieving it, it's probably going to happen later than we think. And in the interim, in order for Tesla to remain competitive and to continue building out its user base, it needs to offer the whole point of its existence, which is a car that most people could afford. Eventually, those cars then will be able to license full self-driving software. So to me, it was an admission of almost like sanity, like we're not going to, we're not sticking only to the edges. And I think that's in part why the market really responded well after earnings, because it saw, yeah, the, the, the middle path. It's certainly tangible. Like there's no disbelief that Tesla couldn't put a $25,000 car on the road. It's just like, you know, managing costs and materials and the production line. If they can do that without having to 
materially retool the production line, um, then it's it's conceivable. And you can get your head around that might take a year or it might take a, a, a relatively well-known amount of time. FSD is such a who knows, and it's been talked about so long. It's hard to credibly put numbers on that. People like Kathy Wood try to, but uh, you know, whenever dates get shared, it usually ends up with egg on the face of the person who came up with that date eventually. Right. Well, this is why, in part, we're talking about Tesla this morning. So shares are shares are up uh, <clears throat> a significant amount as amount as we're recording, up twelve percent, because earlier earlier this morning, and I'll read read the quote. Uh, from the Wall Street Journal, Tesla has won Beijing's blessing to roll out its advanced driver assistance service in China. As chief executive Elon Musk made a surprise visit to the company's biggest overseas. I'll, I'll read a couple more paragraphs here. Chinese officials told Tesla that Beijing has tentatively approved the company's plan to launch its full self-driving FSD software feature in the country. The U.S. electric vehicle maker will deploy its autonomous driving services based on mapping and navigation functions provided by Chinese technology giant Baidu. To me, this is a a huge deal because the second part of the earnings call from, from earlier in the week, Elon said very explicitly, if you do not believe that we could solve autonomous driving, you should not invest in Tesla. And... I like what you said, you know, that there's these these things that are unpredictable in terms of, you know, final valuations and the the pace at which all of this happens and price per share, all, all of that. You know, it, it sounds clownish in, in, in some, some respects. But when the CEO, who knows more about the company than anyone else on the planet, tells you point blank, this is what the company is about. Uh, to me, as a founder, you know, as as this uh, generational founder led, just not just CEO, but but visionary. He's he's I think telling investors very clearly: you have to update your understanding of what Tesla is, and it is futuristic. It is so far beyond what you know we're comfortable with. Because no, but there are no self-driving cars on the road yet. Although, I mean, even that is only partly true. But you either believe me or you don't. And I think that's a very, to me, uh, convincing reason to actually either get off the ride or double down. There, if you're a skeptic, right, and you don't think this could be solved, then then you have all the reasons to to exit, right? You know, your language is so interesting. Oh, so while I was in Austin, uh, I recently got to sit in on two lectures that uh, Christoph was hosting at University of Texas. And one of them was uh, for his literature class, Roger Federer as religious experience. Well, you know, the language you're using now makes me think this is a potential lecture for your rhetoric class, which is like Tesla investment as religious experience. Is it, what is <laughs> Musk saying when he says like, shareholders you must you have to believe this thing to be a shareholder i don't know if he's trying to mitigate uh volatility from the skeptics maybe there, there is you know so uh, some ambiguity here his tone did not say it, he wasn't selling it i think in the in the as shareholders believe me when i tell you this will be the thing that saves tesla i think he was legitimately saying you have lots of reasons to invest or not invest in Tesla, but the investment case does not make sense if you cannot, as an investor, wrap your mind around us solving FSD because then everything else falls apart. Like he, 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 the numbers from Musk's perspective, like we're not just an auto EV company and because our share price is basically too expensive for us to be just an EV company. So if you don't think, if you legitimately don't think we could solve this problem, you legitimately should sell because there's nothing else we're going to do that will make up for it. I I won't push you on this because I, uh, maybe I was being a bit facetious with my interpretation. And if you, if you try, I mean, it is the reality, right? If you, if you value Tesla, like a car company, the valuation makes absolutely no sense today. You have to 
you know, have a bit of divine intervention uh, for this thing to make sense. And you have to have maybe a little bit of religious belief that uh, they are going to essentially create life. You know, somewhat, some, it is an element of AGI, right? It's very specific. I'm obviously, going, I'm going a bit of a nonsense direction here, but they are doing, they're using the same technologies that are being used, transformers that are being used to explore potential, you know, pathways to AGI. So, um, so let's take the religious bit out because I was probably teasing you a bit there. But... Well, well, if, if if I may, really, I, I get I get that sense because in that, I mean, Musk is inspiring. Like you either believe in in this as our mission or you don't. Hmm. But the reason it's qualified is because I mean, this takes us back to why this is such a big deal. What happened this morning? I have the the uh, FSD version twelve. You've written in it. And it's just this, just this level is mind blowing when you realize what the car is doing on its own. So there's already evidence on the street. So, you know, religion, if if for something to really be a religious belief, you you need to have zero evidence or else it's not legit belief, right? We now have way more than evidence than, than, you know, so it's no longer (laughs) belief in, in, the impossible because it's already happening. But then you have this release that China is now basically Musk and Tesla cracked a huge regulatory hurdle. What will that do to have millions of Teslas driving around in China now collecting data? That's going to exponentially expedite the rate at which FSD actually becomes a reality. And on top of that, let me just drop the last piece of data, the reason Tesla's free cash flow was down by a billion dollars or something is because they bought all the, all the NVIDIA H100 GPU chips that they possibly could, and they said they are no longer constrained by compute. You add all of the necessary AI capabilities, you open up Tesla, no company in the world right now is collecting data about autonomous driving as quickly and efficiently as Tesla. And you're now betting, if you think Tesla can't do this, you're now betting against, I think, increasing amounts of evidence that that not only is this doable, but it's the, the rate at which it's happening is going to be faster than anyone thought. I agree. And I think the technology is probably going to get there before the regulations. It's, it's the regs that are going to hold it up. Like the US and probably China, like... Um, Tesla's partner in China is a company called Baidu, who I'm also a shareholder in, funnily enough. Um, and Baidu have their own robo-taxi fleet of a few hundred cars live in, I think now three different um, cities in China. So, so you've got like the Chinese regulators and the US regulators actually perhaps being a bit gung-ho and just kind of getting on with it. And I know Musk had a successful meeting with the Swedish regulators re- recently where he demoed FSD to them and they were quite impressed. But I sense that it's, from just from my experience in the UK, I sense that it's going to be a much longer journey to get this stuff live in Europe. But, you know, maybe maybe he can get there. Maybe I mean, North America is probably more advanced than any other territory. Are American regulators open to this stuff? And, and we have to accept that there will still be some level of deaths caused by FSD but it's like the, you know, the juggling act that the regulator has to do is, is they have to say, well, if this is objectively fewer deaths than human drivers, it's net benefit. But the court cases, you know, the, it's not just regulation. It's like what happens when there are deaths? Who's accountable? There's a lot of probably questions that are being answered now. It's going to take a long time for society to make this transition successfully, I think. Well, maybe, but I think this is right. This is what's so interesting to me about China. I, I, I've, I've never been, uh, so I'm talking just out of you know my broad stereotypical understanding, but that's a highly, highly regulated country. That's the most populous in the world. So for them to give the green light to Tesla to do this experiment, that means they are think, you know, they're they're the opposite of Texas, where it's kind of like, yeah, anything goes, and eventually, you know, we'll we'll figure, you know, we'll. In other words, China seems to me they're going to present the best possible bureaucratic case for why this should be legal and everywhere, 
And then if the deaths, as you see, if death rates of accidents start going down, how could Europe then ethically look at the data if it's if it turns out the way we think it will be and say, mm, no, not us, because we have too many laws that are complicated. I think it's going to expedite things massively. I hope it does, because I'd like to have FSD actually doing something useful in the UK, but I just feel like it's going to be a long way off. But but we can we don't Europe and the UK don't need to be on board for this problem to be solved. Right. So let's land the Tesla plane, Christoph. Uh, what's the big takeaway on this one? Is okay. Musk's founder leadership taking the company in the right direction? Do you think? Do you think recent stock price moves are founded in reality? So yes, yes to that. But I think the more important principle is that. One of the strongest reasons to invest in the company is when you have a founder-led leader that's also a visionary, and you have more reason to believe in the success of these kinds of companies than you would otherwise if it was just some, call it, less invested leader. And Musk is the paragon of, maybe in the world, of the most, for better or worse, most visionary and most obsessed with his companies as his life's work. And so when I hear news, when I hear these developments, I have more confidence in the long-term success of a company than if it was some other kind of CEO. Very good. So do you own any Tesla, either in your King of the Jungle portfolio or in your real money portfolio? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, as you know, my my journey in the last year has been mostly to sell out of the market and stay invested predominantly in companies that I thought were uncorrelated from market forces because I'm quite uh, scared about the big picture debt levels and macro picture. So I was in my king of the jungle portfolio. I I was only dealing with small caps that are uh, one is biotech another one is bitcoin and the third one is eos the uh, battery storage company well as of this morning i added my first <laughs> first legitimately good company to the portfolio and that is uh tesla that's uh in the king of the jungle in my real world portfolio tesla was the one company that i still owned shares in and i added more also, uh, on Friday, uh, last week. Let's, uh, let's pop the spreadsheet up and see how Tesla looks alongside your other holdings. Well, it's tiny. <laughs> yeah, well, you've just started. Take us on the journey. We haven't talked about the King of the Jungle portfolio for a while. And actually, as a quick reminder to listeners, Christoph and I are having a bit of fun on the side, and we're wagering real money. We started these off with a small amount of money, $1,000, and we're trying to show that it is possible to grow $1,000 into something material over a long time and we're going to do a one-year check-in and we're adding a hundred bucks every month we're using just kind of man in the street apps i think you're using sofi i'm using trading 212 and you know we're doing stuff that anybody could do these are very accessible amounts of money so uh, and we're taking very different strategies so yes it would seemingly your strategy has not played out so far take us on the uh, journey of where we are today yeah, to say that it hasn't played out so far is an understatement. <clears throat> I have major egg uh, on my face as of this moment. I could tell you part of it I don't think is yet can be classified as a mistake, but part of it definitely was. My largest position is in Coherus, and nothing has changed except more good news from that company. We're still waiting for that inflection point that I thought would have happened uh, sometime around the February March earnings call, but management went on the call and said they are withholding proper full year guidance because there wasn't enough time from the moment their their products were approved by the FDA to get a sensible projection for future revenues. So basically, we're in we're in further waiting period. So the major upside to Coherence is still it's like a loaded spring, but. I also made a huge mistake. Well, in hindsight, it's huge, uh, <clears throat> which is that I bought uh, calls. They weren't short dated, but they were not long dated. So because this inflection point I'm still confident in, I wanted to leverage my upside. 
And so I bought Cohere's calls dated in May. Well, that's around the corner and it ain't going to happen. So those calls will, will, will expire worthless. In hindsight, had the last earnings call provided the full guidance as expected, then you know I would have been sitting here smiling saying, yeah, look how smart I am because I knew a lot about this company. I knew this was coming. coming. I used leverage in an appropriate moment and yay me, right? Instead, the opposite happened, like not yet. And so the the safer thing to have done would be for me to have bought either additional shares and not messed with options at all, or bought the longest dated calls available, which would have been more expensive. And so I tried to get the timing just right. And as often happens with options, if I'm right about the inflection point, it'll be a couple months beyond the date and I'll have nothing to show for it. So that in part explains why I'm basically down to my starting original investing amount. Actually, I'm down $400 because we added right $100 each. So I'm about, uh, so I've lost $400 so far, most of it due to the options expiring worthless. And as you said uh, many episodes ago, like this is why options and derivatives are complex because you don't just have to be right like your, your timing has to be right as well. Like if you'd bought Cohera shares, then you, need, you only have to be right eventually. Obviously, the one-year point is when the competition ends, uh, but that's arbitrary. As an investor, like your investing timeline is potentially your lifetime. Exactly. So uh, I keep mentioning hindsight bias because this could have gone either way, but I knew that I was, I was taking a risk, and in this case, the risk did not work out. I don't know if you're going to shake your head in disbelief or whether whether this is me still trying to figure out, you know, whether this is still a good, like a aggressive but good strategy. I'm still tempted. I'm tempted to buy more coherence options with the next round of $100 dated to the end of the year because the inflection point I'm expecting to be either the next call or the one after that. But as of now, you know, my portfolio returns are are suffering greatly because of the options expirations. And let me add, uh, in all in all my investments, none the the three companies I had until to adding Tesla this morning, none of them have yet uh, had their, you know, look at us, we're going to be uh, a successful company and you're buying us at the low price point. So, Coherus, uh, Iris Energy, and EOS are still waiting for their basic, their magic moments. And uh, the way the spreadsheet's structured, in the middle, you're showing the percentage gain or loss on each individual position. So it's not that like the real money loss; it's the percentage loss. So back, whatever that is, is down nearly a hundred percent. What's that all about? Yeah, so that's another uh, option in which I bet that the Bank of America will go down. And uh, because of the macro... I'll let my wife know. She works for them. (laughs) 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 So this was more of my macro bets, uh, me being very pessimistic about the quality, you know, what's going on in terms of uh, interest rates staying higher for longer and massive debt levels and banks having really messy balance sheets. Uh, and their ties to commercial real estate, which, you know, it's another one of these things, right? Which is, it is in plain sight, but how long it takes for some of these things to actually drift down and start affecting other companies is always a unknown. So I took that bet. You know what, you know, reflecting on this, this, this is why some, you know, uh, dealing with timing in the market is hard. If you think about when I made these bets, it was, it was around November, and at that point, the market was was really, really bearish. And that's around the time shortly thereafter that Powell, the, the Fed, the U.S. Fed, basically said rate cuts are coming, right? And from that time on, the market went on a massive bull run. However, it is now uh, May, almost May. In one, neither we have not yet had a single rate cut, but now the likelihood of these rate cuts has been pushed out even further because I think the data I was looking at was actually correct 
or accurate or more right than wrong. And so we have, we continue to have this interesting situation where, in a sense, I was right about the data, but the market went the exact opposite way. I made bets that had a time principle in them. I'm going to lose most of the value in these contracts, but I still wasn't wrong. It's just, you know, the market's going to do what the market's going to do. And for me, from my perspective, it's frustrating to, to watch this. Uh, and the story is not over. So, you know, in the end, it's the results that matter, right? And the results right now on my side of the scorecard are abysmal, even though the reasoning I think was still solid and I was not proven wrong. Whereas maybe you could talk a- about your results now. Yeah, like I've, tr- I've tried to, I've tried to put aside the competition element of the King of the Jungle portfolio. Like I, I didn't mind whether I won or lost. I just wanted to try and showcase how I invest and how I've invested over the last 20 years. And I just try and keep it real simple. Like I just try and be diversified, own what I perceive to be the world's best companies and own them for a very long time. And a year is not a very long time. So I saw it as a huge element of luck as to whether my greatest companies in the world would outperform your randomness over the course of the one year time frame. And it seems like we're in some, you know, one of the realities where that has proven to be the case so far competition is not over yet um but i would i would be proud of my results at the end of the competition not if i won or lost the contest but if they if i think my decision making was robust and i think my decision making has been robust i'm happy with my holdings i actually added to one of my favorite companies today i added to mercado libre so i bought uh $100 allocation, probably back near to when the contest started. That's performed okay. It's up about, I think it's might be up about 18% since then. And I've added another 50 bucks today. I'm not all in on anything. I'm pretty wide, widely diversified. Still got a nice chunk of cash, about 23% of my money's in cash there, which is actually almost identical to my real money portfolio right now. Because if, if valuations do take a pounding, then I'm going to put that cash into play. And I'm hoping to do that in my real portfolio too. Um, and I particularly like Mercado Libre right now, just because I think they are a fantastic company with a very strong founder leader. And they've got earnings in a couple of days time. And I think the market has got it wrong on Mercado Libre a little bit. Mm-hmm. Some things in their February earnings, as well as macro in South America, and maybe has suppressed their valuation a little bit. And it feels to me like, an incredible company at a very fair price. So why not chuck an extra 50 bucks in? And I say that for the contest, but in my real money portfolio, I'm also adding, and it's significantly more than an extra 50 bucks. Right. So uh, uh, obviously your strategy is the one that I know and, uh, and believe in. Though, you know, if we're trying to uh, analyze this in terms of the process, I'm disappointed with the results and b- besides the options, I don't think my process is wrong because remember, what we, the thing I didn't mention is that when you invest in a company like Coheres, which is biotech, the gains are less steady and slow over time. The gains are actually, you either succeed or you don't. And the gains could be, you know, we're talking about hundreds of percent re-rating in a short amount of time. So uh that just i think is a case of not not yet but not that it's not happening and same story with eos you know i'm not going for small small gains i'm going for hundreds of percent and even though that's a very risky investment the the progress being made is still real so i'm not ready to call the strategy either random or or a mistake it's just the timelines required you know the 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 structure of these investments is very different. Hey, look, if you stuck like $1,500 into this and you've learned a real lesson about some of your option strategy, well, that is going to pay you back, you know, tenfold, a hundredfold in your real portfolio. Like I, I learned a silly lesson today, right? I was on the way back from the run, had to jump in the shower and I really wanted to add that Mercado Libre stock. So I just, I just like smashed the buttons on my trading 212 app and I just did like a market order for 50 bucks. It's like 50 bucks, who cares, right? right? And 
I actually got like a, a an inferior price to the the actual market price because who knows what trading two one two will do under the covers. And what I should have done, or I'd normally do if I had a few more minutes, is I'd have calculated it properly and put in a limit order, so I knew, uh, you know, I'm I'm buying at or below a certain price. And I was a bit lazy because I didn't care about the fifty dollars really. Um, but I've learned a lesson there, like hard reminder. If I'm doing a real trade in my real portfolio and I don't use limit orders, that could hurt me, you know, quite significantly. So, you know, if we're learning, if we're learning silly little lessons or reminders of things we know already as a consequence of this competition, then it had enormous value for us. Indeed. Anyway, I'm glad, Luke, to have a, a, a best in class company finally on my side of the ledger in, in <laughs> Tesla to, to join my... Uh... <laughs> my wannabes right now it's what may so we still have the first round of the competition so we have six okay. months left so we're halfway through the competition and i'm getting my ass whooped to the tune of about seven hundred dollars so uh not looking good for for your pal monkey but I have not given up yet. I think there there might be some special special treats for my portfolio in the next couple of months. Well, I'm going to be magnanimous in victory when it comes to the line. So don't worry too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Longer chat than usual, but I hope you found it interesting. If you stuck with us through the whole nearly hour, we are on YouTube and all major podcast platforms. I'll repeat my plea from midway. Do go leave us a review. That'd be really helpful. Um, you can also find us at our website, wallstreetwildlife.com. We've got the 10 Laws of the Jungle PDF download there, sitting ready for your delectation. Yep, and I would recommend everyone checking out Luke's X profile to see his project, his portfolio review, at 7 Luke Hallard, H A L L. A R D. And of course, while you're there, go click follow on Christoph too uh, to see his insights on worldly wisdom. He is at seven flying platypus. All right, that's a wrap. That is a wrap. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. <laughs> A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.